Dear guests, dear colleagues and friends, it's my pleasure on behalf of the program and organizing committee to welcome all of you to the 22nd edition of Comsys Tech Conference. We sincerely regret that the circumstances oblige us to hold this year's edition in a mixed mode, online and face-to-face. For all the participants who do not have a possibility to come to see University of Rosé, let's make a short virtual walk in the campus. This year, our host is Canev Center in University of Rosé. As a tradition, we will start with Bulgarian folklore dance. Our dancers from Dance Ensemble Harmonia, students, teachers, and staff from University of Rosé will welcome you with a traditional Bulgarian folklore dance.
if you'd like, you can dance with them.
After this spectacular performance, I'd like to give the floor to the rector of the University of Russe, Professor Christo Beloev, to welcome the participants in the conference. Уважаеми гости, драги колеги, позволете ми от името на Академичната общност на Русенския университет и лично от мое име да ви приветствам с добре дошли на 22-то издание на Международната научна конференция Комсестех, която по известни на всички причина тази година се провежда в смесен режим, присъствено и онлайн. Но точно за Академичната общност по компютинг това изобщо не е проблем, защото вие сте движаща сила на дигиталната трансформация на образованието. Ценим високо усилията на вашата академична общност да води активен научен живот и ще подпомагаме активно всичките ви научни изяви. Специални благодарности искам да изкажа на организаторите на конференцията. Радваме се, че конференцията Компсестех е вече утвърдена, и става все по-популярна в страната и Европа. Фактът, че днес в тази виртуална зала присъстват учени от няколко страни, е достатъчно красноречиво доказателство за това. Друго доказателство за притегателната сила и нивото на конференцията е фактът, че повече от 13 години докладите изнесени на Компсестех се публикуват в виртуалната библиотека на Асоциацията по компютри най-авторитетната международна организация в областта на компютинга и се индексират от Скопус. Много впечатляваш е и профила на конференцията в Google Scholar. Това, че конференцията има импак ранг, също е факт, който заслужава да бъде специално отбелязан. Пожелавам на всички участници ползотворни контакти и успешно представяне. И нека настоящата конференция постигне своите цели. На добър час! We would like to express our deepest gratitude for Professor Belov's support to the conference. Professor Diana Antonova, Vice Rector of Research and Development, is also here with us in the room. We have also received a greetings address from Professor Kosta Bushnakov, head of SAI. Thank you, Professor Bushnakov. Such greetings addresses were also received from other organizations. Many thanks to all. After the introduction, let's start with the plenary session. I will pass the button to the co-chair of the program committee, Professor Cvetomir Vasiliev. Hello everyone for me, from me. Welcome to the 22nd edition of our conference. Uh, we are really sorry that we couldn't see you here face to face at the University of Russe, but the fact that some of you are already here in this uh, hall in Kanev Center is promising and we hope that next year all of us will be here and the conference will be face to face. Okay, as we see today, we have three plenary speakers and uh, we will listen to their talks and they will present their work for about 30 minutes. So let me introduce our first speaker. It's Professor Martin Vechev. Uh, professor Vechev is a professor of computer science at ETH Zurich, where he leads the secure, reliable and intelligent systems lab. His work spans the intersection of artificial intelligence and programming languages, including both theoretical and system aspects. 
Professor Vechev has given a number of invited and keynote talks on these topics at various conferences and workshops. Together with his group, they have built a number of AI systems now widely used in academia and industry. He has also co-founded two startups, Deep Code, which aims to revolutionize programming using AI and chain security, which brings security to decentralized systems using advanced automated reasoning. His research has received numerous awards. Okay, Professor Vechev, now I will make you a presenter. I will also ask you to turn on your camera. Now your presenter, you can share your screen. And you have the floor. All right, so thank you very much. Let me let me try to share here. Uh, <clears throat> All right. All right. So it should be it should share now. Yes, yes, we can see everything. All right, great. Um, all right, so thank you for the introduction and thanks for the invitation. Um, so if you have any questions during the talk, you can just type them here in the public chat and uh, you can make it interactive. If during the talk you have questions, you can you can type here and I'll, I'll take a look and answer uh, occasionally. All right, so uh, let me see if just the scrolling works. It works, okay. All right, so my name is Martin Vetev. As mentioned, I'm professor at ETH Zurich in the Department of Computer Science. And uh, <clears throat> today I want to tell you about one of the most exciting developments that I've seen uh, computing in the last uh, you know, 10, 20 years and something we're very, very involved in. Um, so I hope you find it interesting. Uh, so as many of you know, uh, you know deep learning uh, has revolutionized the entire areas of science uh, and technology and our economy, including at autonomous driving, medicine, natural language understanding, game playing, and uh, much more. And there have been substantial number of technical advances uh, in deep learning over the last uh, uh, you know, many years, not just over the last 10, 12 years, but you know, over the last 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, so uh, many of these are summarized in books, in tutorials and courses and so on. However, despite this uh, success, uh, initial success, there has been um, an increasing concern um, and some uh, fundamental issues, some key problems that uh, deep learning seems to exhibit and which tend to preclude its more broader applications and uh, materializing all the impact that can have. Uh, <clears throat> so here are some of the issues that that um, that are uh, becoming apparent. Uh, so for instance, deep learning is too much labeled data to learn from. It does not generalize well to distribution of shifts uh, to similar distributions. Uh, one of the fundamental problems that we'll be talking about today is the lack of robustness and general safety that these models provide. Uh, difficult to in incorporate background knowledge, uh, lack of reasoning abilities, interpretability, and many other many other issues that the community is trying to address and build new kinds of like deep learning 2.0 models. Uh, today, however, we're going to be talking about um, how to build accurate, meaning useful, um, deep learning models which are mathematically guaranteed using mathematical techniques guaranteed to be safe and robust. So they're doing what they are supposed to be doing. Uh, so this is really just a small part of the research we are looking at, um, both at the university at ETH, but also in our uh, latest spin-off on uh, trustworthy AI. You can find more information at this link, uh, including um, mathematical methods, uh, training procedures, uh, discussions on fairness, uh, background prior generative models, and much more. So what I want to do now is to give you a sense of uh, how unstable deep learning models are and how surprising and stable they are. I know they're really more unstable than you know a small small child, and uh, we're really just at the beginning of addressing those those issues. Um, so if you take something like robust visual perception, so if you take an image like the digit eight, 
And uh, if you actually perturb this digit eight by uh, some uh, transformations, for instance, by rotations, by flipping it, uh, brightening, adding noise to the image, for instance, these red patches here, all right? Um, these kind of perturbations would not really fool even a small child. They would still be able to classify this uh, image as an eight, but even uh, state-of-the-art deep, deep learning models tend to be confused by these perturbations. So uh, they may misclassify to maybe the digit seven. So the task for verification of deep learning models, one of the tasks, one of the properties that we're interested in, in ensuring is uh, proving, mathematically showing that uh, there is no way in which the image eight in this concrete example can be perturbed um, and uh, uh, you know, to fool the network to classify the digit as, a, as some other uh, label. Okay, so that would be the verification problem and the verification problem may fail. Um, it could be that the model is attackable and one could flip the digits and make transformations that make it not classified to eight. If you look at certification, um, you know, you cannot really unfortunately enumerate all the possible combinations. There's potentially an unbounded number of them or an infinite number, especially when you're talking about, no if you talk about noise, so for instance, you have 784 pixels, you have two choices per pixel, so you'd have two to the 784 combinations, which is clearly infeasible to, to enumerate. At the same time, standard solvers, like mixed integer linear solvers and SMT solvers that have been so successful in verification, actually do not scale to the kind of models that people are using in practice, um, largely due to the type of non-linearities that these models are using. Now, let me give you another example of the issue uh, so that you don't get the idea that it's just for image processing. Um, same thing happens in audio processing. So if you have a sound wave, a recording, or somebody speaks to a microphone, and uh, you'd like the machine learning model to recognize what is being spoken and to transcribe it, for instance, to classify the signal, the audio wave, to a stop, it is possible to change the volume. So for instance, I can speak lower, I can speak much louder, uh, and it can fool the model into classifying the signal to be some other word, not the one that, that's intended, okay? So you can change just the volume of the input and this can fool like state-of-the-art model. So the goal of certification here would be to prove that no matter how you change the volume, uh, you know, up to certain bounds, you cannot affect the classification. Finally, let me give you yet another example. This is the last example uh, on uh, robust natural language processing. That's one of the successful uh, applications of deep learning beyond vision. So you may have something like a sentence here, uh, which says uh, the perfect performance by the actor. So this would be the original sentence. And uh, you may want to use a machine learning model like a deep neural network to classify the sentiment of the sentence to say whether it's a positive or a negative. And so the network may classify it, uh, the model may classify it as a positive, but a small change to the sentence, um, <clears throat> just uh, picking a synonym, uh, for instance, something like the spotless performance by the actor, may actually fold the model into classifying it as a negative uh, sentiment, which is clearly not what, uh, what is meant here, okay? Now, in this particular case, one may think about enumerating all the synonyms, but unfortunately, if you take sentences such as no reason for anyone to invest their hard-earned bucks into a movie which obviously didn't invest much into itself and some other longer sentences, it gets harder and harder to enumerate. Uh, in this particular case, there would be about 23 million combinations um, and so uh, gets more difficult. So verification against perturbations gets harder and harder, okay? And so a simple uh, property that you may want to certify for your model is to prove that no matter how you perturb the sentence um, by picking synonyms, um, or by abstracting certain words, you can, you don't affect the final classification or the final translation if you're doing language translation. So let me give you the mathematical gist of how, at a high level, for how certification of machine learning models, of deep learning model goes these days. And there's been thousands of papers on this and it's a very, very active area of research uh, uh, of interest both uh, in academia, commercially, regulatory, and in you know, many, many other settings. And so what happens here is there are two steps. Um, so the first step is uh, we would uh, produce the specification. And the specification would capture uh, all the possible perturbations that you can do to the input, whether it's the image, the audio wave, or the natural language sentence. And you'd capture those perturbations in a symbolic representation of some kind. So over here on the left, if you see this blue hyperbox here, this, uh, what you see is that there was an image eight at the center and you um, 
you know, built a box, uh, you know, this hyper hyper box here around it, capturing a bunch of other images that are similar. Uh, if you look at uh, natural language processing, you may have a sentence such as fire is cold, which is here in both. And for each of these words like fire and cold, you may have synonyms, for instance, blaze, or you may have chili for cold, right? And each of these words would have an embedding, which are these uh, X's that you see in the second column. And uh, what you can do now is that you can capture those embeddings of all the possible synonyms, essentially right into this box. And then combining those boxes, you'd get a symbolic representation. The high level point here to keep in mind is that by using symbolic representations, essentially logic, you can capture um, an infinite set of possible images that are I know, represent perturbation of the original one. So this is step one. And step two, once you have the symbolic representation capturing the property that you care about, the second point is that you need to somehow verify that all of the points represented within the symbolic region actually classify to the same thing or satisfy some property that you care about. And there are many different verification techniques here. There is deterministic verification, there is statistical verification, depending on the kind of guarantees that you, that you, that you, that you care about. And uh, today we're going to be looking at specifically in deterministic verification. Um, so just before I get into the more technical bits here, uh, I should mention that I think that's a very exciting space also from a technical perspective, not just from usability. It involves really the intersection of two fundamentally you know, different areas, which is continuous reasoning and discrete and symbolic reasoning. So techniques like optimization, abstractions, representing infinite sets of points, projections, finding the nearest point on a surface and logic, right? So traditionally logic and optimizations are somewhat different. Um, and so really rich intersection of interesting areas. Um, so I strongly encourage you to take a look at this space. Now the key technical insight for the verification when you want deterministic guarantees, which is pretty much, pretty much what most people would like, is this uh, observation that uh, deep neural nets are just combinations of compositions of affine functions and uh, specific non-linearities like activations like ReU, sigmoid and other activations. And over the last 40 years uh, in research, we have developed techniques specifically in a field called abstract interpretation, which was invented in the late 70s by Patrick and Radio Cousseau in France. Um, and these abstract interpretation uh, methods uh, are able to automatically prove properties about large scale computations. Um, and, um, you know, they are, they've been extremely successful. They're the basis of all the, uh, all the tools, security analysis, program analysis, verification tools that have been developed uh, basically ever. Um, and so there is a field in abstract interpretation called um, numerical abstract interpretation that deals with numbers, approximating and analyzing programs that manipulate number numeric quantities. So it was very natural to kind of match these two fields of deep learning and abstract interpretation. And this is what we did in a work uh, that appeared a couple of years ago, well now three years ago at a premier conference in security, Oakland SNNP, security and privacy. And the idea of this, this, this work was just to bridge the two areas. Uh, right, and so it was called safety and robustness uh, with abstract interpretation. And here's the high level idea. And you know, this idea is you know, followed by most of the works to, to this date. Uh, it triggered a lot of work in the area, it essentially started this, this uh, area uh, to some degree. So here's the idea uh, you have a symbolic region which captures the set of perturbation to the original image, let's say in this particular case that you care about. Um, and this symbolic box here that you see is uh, represented by some logical formula. So on the le bottom left here, you see uh, some X0 to X783. So we have 784 pixels. And there's some symbolic things going on there, like the epsilon 1, epsilon 783 that you can ignore for now. Think of it that this is just some logical formula that describes the shape. And so now the idea here is that rather than putting, uh, pushing a concrete input for the network by just you know running the model on a concrete image, you run the model on a symbolic image. And if you run a model on a symbolic image, you need to define what is the effect of the individual functions in your network on that symbolic image. And so if you take the shape in the beginning that I show you with the eights, and you push that shape for the layers of the neural network, uh, you would 
obtain some other shape, which captures potentially over approximation of all of the points that you get in the beginning. And so what you want to do here, what the challenge is, is you want to define the abstract transformers, so-called abstract transformers, which is nothing more than the effect of layers in the network on the abstract shape. And so you take the shapes and you push them through, and you know you push them through, and at the end you'd get some shape, and that shape captures um, all of the possible inputs, uh, all of the possible outputs that you could have ever produced by running any of the possible inputs uh, on the initial box without actually enumerating those inputs. So you can think of it as some kind of symbolic computation. So again, be captured by some symbolic formula, and uh, you can check the property that you care about, that everything classifies to the same label in this output uh, symbolic uh, shape. Okay, so the main challenge with uh, certification is defining the effects, these arrows here. What is the effect of um, layers, sigmoid, tan H, affine layers on the uh, symbolic shape rather than on the concrete shape, on the concrete inputs that normally the models work with. And so after this work, there was a tremendous, you know, quite a bit of interest in this in this space, and still there's a you know, massive amount of interest. There's competitions now on this and so on. And I'll summarize you at a higher level what all of these works do. Okay, so what they do is something called the single neuron abstract transformer. So what they do is they take a shape, which is this funny blue thing that you see on the left, that's a form of polyhedra called zonotop. That's not so important for our analysis. The main point is that there is this blue shape that captures potentially an infinite number of values that these neurons X1 and X2 can take. And then what you need to do is you need to define the effect of the real U, uh, rectified linear activation on this uh, blue shape. Uh, which is essentially taking the max of zero and x1. Uh, and so what all of these works did is just different ways of computing this output shape, the blue one. And the essential bit here that's important to understand is that uh, not how they did it, but the fact that when they compute the constraints associated with y1, they only look at the constraints associated with x1. And when they compute the constraints associated with Y2, they only look at the constraint associated with X2. And so this independent computation is attractive also because you can do this uh, computation in parallel on the GPU, all right, so speed it up. However, it actually loses precision. So you may uh, actually include more points than you should include. So this is something I would refer to as single neuron abstract transformers because the output for Y1, the constraints, only look at the constraints for X1. So uh, some examples of what the, what the approximations of what these computations do is best illustrated on this, on, you know, this example here. Here you have X, which is the input neuron, and you have Y, which is the output neuron, and you have the, uh, you have the, um, Mm, the definition of the real u function, which is just taking the max of zero and x, right? So the output is going to be uh, positive. Um, not strictly positive, but positive because it can be zero or greater. And this is captured in this green uh, piecewise linear shape. What you see here on the left, lx and ux are just the bounds that you can lower an upper bounds that you can get for the input uh, neuron x. And so what you want to do is to actually approximate this green line, this green, uh, this green um, piecewise uh, linear shape. The reason why you need to approximate it is that if you don't approximate it and you just treat it as is, your analysis, your verification is not going to scale, but to a very, very, very small networks, and it's just not going to be very useful. So one way to approximate it and to obtain a convex shape, um, right, is uh, so don't worry if you don't know what a convex is; it's just a particular kind of shape that is easier to manipulate. Uh, so in this particular case, we can approximate, meaning we can cover all of the points that the green, line, green lines cover by just including everything in the blue region and the green region, of course. So you'd have this shape, which is something like a triangle, which is essentially the optimal thing you can do in, in, in when you're looking at the single neuron space. Unfortunately, that's actually still quite expensive to manipulate. Uh, you're not going to handle large networks. And so over time, people came up with other approximations, which approximate this green piecewise shape, other convex shapes, so something like a box, something like a zonotop, um, and uh, you know, polyhedra uh, approximations, and all kinds of things like this, which aim to capture, to balance uh, precision with scalability. So they don't want to include too many garbage points in these blue regions, 
you know, they want to be as close to the green line, lines as possible, but they also want to be amenable to easy analysis. So the complexity of these abstract transformers, asymptotic complexity, should be as cheap as possible. So there's a nice space uh, precision, uh, sorry, uh, precision time trade-off here. All right. And so this actually triggered people. There was a work by Microsoft Research in uh, 2019, which said uh, something called a convex relaxation barrier. And what they stipulated was that uh, you cannot actually do better than the triangle, almost kind of an impossibility result. So if you want to use single neuron abstract transformers, uh, sorry, if you want to do any kind of approximation and analysis, you have to approximate with the triangle. That's the best, best convex approximation that you can get. Uh, it turned out that this is actually not quite true. Um, it's only best when you're talking about the single neuron case. So if you actually consider things beyond two neurons, beyond a single neuron, and you actually consider two neurons at a time, like X1 and X2, so here is this uh, rotated box, and this gray box captures all the possible values that X1 and X2 can take. So for instance, X1 and X2 both can be zero, they can be zero and minus two, the edge points of the box and everything inside. So if you actually treat them separately like we did before, so I look at X1, then I compute the constraints for Y1, I look at X2 and I compute the constraints for Y2, you'd end up with the blue region up top on the right. This is the shape that you'd get for Y1 and Y2, okay? However, if you actually treat X1 and X2 together, you'd end up with a tighter shape, which is the triangle in, in the bottom. And so joint optimization, joint processing gives you more uh, better results. So this is something we did uh, uh, last year and this you know, broke this barrier. Um, okay, so uh, this is just gives you a little bit of a high level idea uh, you know, how certification works by just approximating the activations using convex shapes. Um, now, there's been many, many different approximations. They are relatively complex to describe mathematically. We're not going to have time to do this here. Um, and people are coming up with more and more. There's been hundreds of this. Um, what we've done, however, we've, you know, based on these theoretical uh, you know, convex shapes and, and propagations and whatnot, we actually build a framework called the RAND. Uh, so it's for ETH robustness analyzer, which uh, takes as input a neural network in whatever format you have, PyTorch or Onyx or something else takes a precondition and takes a postcondition like robustness, and you can then feed it into the verifier and it will tell you to whether it manages to verify or not. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there is a verification competition. This is the second year it's running. It's associated with CAF, and you can go and check it out. There was about 20, uh, 20 teams last year. Uh, so I ran this verify verification framework, was uh, one on the four out of the five categories, and I think it tied on the fifth one. So as of today, this is, this is probably the most used framework for neural network certification. Now let me give you an example in geometric certification, just to come back to the, that you don't get the idea that we're just uh, adding noise to pixels. If you want to do something like this, uh, if you have a digit eight, uh, digit three as an image, and you want to prove that um, the robustness that the neural network could classify uh, every rotation of this digit three uh, in the range zero to 30 degrees, right? Uh, that could be one challenge. And what would happen then is that you would have to take the function, the code or the procedure which does the rotation, typically involving some interpolation, bilinear or bicubic interpolation, and then you would process this rotation function using this interval range on the angle zero to 30 degrees. So you'd end up with some convex shape, like the one I'm showing you here, this funny blue one. And then this convex shape is going to capture all the possible rotations that you can ever do, which potentially could be infinite or unboundedly large because of interpolation. So you cannot enumerate the angles. Um, and then you can take that shape and then you can push that shape using the verification techniques from before. So the whole thing is completely modular. You can process the pipeline, get a convex shape and push it with the uh, verification method through the network and prove the property that everything in the shape classifies to three. So that's an example of using the framework. Um, okay, so what I told you about now is, um, I told you about um, a little bit about certification uh, and about the challenges with certification, which is coming up with smaller, smaller convex shapes, which are actually quick to propagate through the layers. Uh, it's still a very active area of research here. 
But one of the fundamental problems is that no matter how good your you know, mathematical guarantees become and how good your convex approximations are, even if you pick the tightest possible ones, uh, the neural networks today are not meant to be verifiable. So you're actually not going to be able to verify much. You're going to be verify, able to verify very small perturbations. And so what you want to do is you want to think about how to build, how to create, how to invent new methods for creating and training neural nets or machine learning models in general, which are more certifiable, that are easier to prove correct, to certify, be it robustness, fairness, bias, or whatever properties that you care about. So that's the second fundamental dimension that people are looking at. So let me give you the high level idea of one of the techniques we introduced, which has also become um, standard by now. Uh, so the idea is actually very simple, uh, conceptually. Um, mathematically, it's a bit involved, but uh, conceptually, it's quite simple. So what you do is just like before, you take this shape called S of X here, which captures all the possible perturbations you care about, potentially an infinite set, and you push it through, just like before, all the way to the end. And when you push it all the way to the end through the layers of the neural network, you're going to end up with a shape called M sharp S of X, just capturing the fact that you have propagated the shape for the model M, which consists of these arrows, the layers. And then what you want to do is to ask the following basic question. How can I change the weights of the network so that when I propagate those shapes through these layers, the shapes that I see here become smaller? So you can think of it in this way. You have a program and you have some parameters in your program and you want to tweak those parameters so that when you push these convex shapes through, the shapes get smaller. So you induce less over approximation and less garbage in the shapes. And you can mathematically phrase this problem as the min max problem on the right. Um, it essentially summarizes what I said. It says, find the weight theta uh, of the network such that, um, such that the worst case behavior of the loss is minimized. So essentially, if you look at the inner product here where it says max L, all it says is find the worst case behavior of the loss, find the point Z in this big shape that maximizes the loss of your network, so makes it behave as worse as possible. And then find weights which minimize this worst case behavior. You know, it's a min max formulation. And so uh, that's a standard uh, training method for producing more certifiable models by now. Uh, and many, many improvements uh, have been done to these methods, but more or less, it, it, you know, high level idea is the same. And you know, the optimization problem is the same. There was a, it was picked up by, uh, by DeepMind uh, after we published it and did some also some improvements uh, to the method. Um, but however, uh, unfortunately, uh, despite best efforts, we using these training methods, right, trying to produce more certifiable networks, we still have not so great results. We have about 70% accuracy on CIFAR 10, which is one of the major data sets, and about 54% certified robustness. Certified robustness just means that, um, you know, uh, 53.9% of the images are classified correct. And uh, not only they're classified correct, but they are, you, for them, you can actually prove that a region around the image always classifies to the same thing. So certified robustness is necessarily lower than or equal to accuracy, but cannot be higher. Now, to give you a perspective, the standard accuracy on CIFAR 10 network is about 90, you know, 98, 99%. So 70% is essentially a useless model. Uh, but what we get here is the certified robustness, which otherwise you would get zero if you take a normal, uh, normal network. So we are very far still from solving this problem. And one of the question is, why doesn't this work yet? Given that there are universal approximation theorems which say that it is possible to find such a network. And the fundamental problem seems to be around the fact that the uh, more complex abstractions, more complex convex relaxations of the one I showed you actually tend to induce more difficult optimization problems, discontinuous non-smooth optimization problems. So gradient descent cannot find the solution, even though it exists. So this is the work that we did uh, just recently. We, it's an archive and submitted why tighter convex relaxations actually hurt training, which is completely not intuitive. Uh, it's a paradox of, of a sort. So anyway, bottom line is we're still trying to solve this problem. 
it involves all kinds of you know convex relaxations, different optimization problems, and so on. Now, uh, one thing you can do here is you can potential path forward would be to produce simpler optimization problems, not this min max formulations. Now, this min max formulation, the fundamental problem is that you have to back propagate through the not just for the activation functions that you have in normal networks, but also for the uh, for the functions that compute the convex relaxations, which is very hard, much more difficult problem. So let's try to produce a simpler optimization problem and see what happens. So this is a one slide summary of what is, you know, last year was an I, I clear it's a top machine learning conference oral paper, so one of the you know, selected papers. And what it does is it produces a simpler uh, optimization problem than the one I showed you um, and uh, gets uh, better results. And the idea about this thing is summarized really in, in this one slide. And what it says is that again, you take your shape and you push that shape for the layers, like layer H1, and you get another shape. And once you get this other shape, rather than pushing it all the way to the end, you say, well, can you find a point in this blue shape, the first one, uh, this region, such that uh, this point, this concrete point, makes the loss behave badly. And if you find such a point, what you want to do then is to mitigate the bad behavior of this point by changing the weights for H2, H3. So you can think of it in this way. You find a problem in the, after the first layer, H1, and then you say, well, I don't want this problem to appear when I push this point all the way at the, to the end of the network for H2 and H3. So I have to change H2 and H3, the weights for H2, H3 to mitigate this problem. So I can do this, and uh, when I do that, uh, my optimization problem is much simpler because I no longer have to differentiate for these you know, abstract transformers. You can find more details in the paper, and uh, but I think this is the you know the way forward for uh, uh, producing models which we can prove something about mathematically. Okay, so uh, I don't want to take too much of your time. Uh, uh, this is really a preview of a much broader agenda, and it's you know it, trustworthy AI is you know its own area right now. Uh, over the last, what I wanted to tell you, what I wanted to leave you with is that over the last uh, four years. Um, we have been teaching this course at DTH Zurich. I've been teaching this course called Reliable and Interpretable AI. This course, due to popular demand, is actually now on YouTube, uh, and the lectures are public together with the exercises. It's actually the only comprehensive technical course that I know uh, in the world that is that is uh, that is taught on this topic. So it talks about mathematical techniques for creating safe, secure, fair, uh, you know, machine learning, deep learning systems. Mostly research from the last four years, and it's typically attended by uh, you know. 200 or more ETH students in PhD, graduate students in computer science, mathematics, physics, statistics, and others. And uh, you can find actually the, um, all the materials on YouTube, they're public, and many people have followed them. So that's all I wanted to tell you. Uh, I hope that it was interesting and uh, happy to take questions, and uh, I wish you to enjoy the conference. Thank you very much to Professor Vechev for the interesting talk. Do you have any questions? If you have any questions, please turn on your microphone and ask a question. I guess feel free to type it as well. <laughs> Okay, any questions? While they're thinking, I will ask a question. Yeah, go ahead, uh, yeah. <laughs> you, you showed us a number, 53.9, with the first method, and then you said it could be improved. Can you give us an approximate such percentage of certified images for the second approach you mentioned? Right, so it, it actually goes up by about 10%, which is quite substantial. And importantly, the accuracy also goes up by 10%. So okay. just, to give, just to give you context here, um, before this method, there used to be, I mean, there still are many people, including in you know, large companies like Google and others, running many, many GPUs, many, many resources, uh, trying to solve the original optimization problem. 
and uh, it just didn't work that well. Uh, it works in certain cases, but not uh, not in all cases. So we actually got those numbers with a single GPU in 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 half a day. So I think there's a lot of potential. Uh, uh, so yeah, so that's uh, that's basically. I mean, we are still trying to get the numbers. Uh, uh, trying to get the numbers higher. There's other techniques now based on this method that get higher. Okay, there are some questions in the public chat. Would you compare, please, the digital filters with neuron sets? So, what do you mean? I mean, digital filters like Kalman filters or Bayesian filters, or I don't know what you mean by neuron sets. Do you mean by neuron nets or another yeah. question is, do you use and, uh... entropy analysis in your analysis? Well, I mean, there is, uh, when you analyze the network, you need to consider the cross entropy loss, right? When you're doing the training. So at that level, we do consider it. Uh, you need to consider the loss function, which is part of the optimization. In order to increase the accuracy and realize the proposed models, do you think that quantum computing can be helpful? Quantum, <laughs> we, we actually work on quantum computing, but in slightly different problem. Um, you know, I think that the area of quantum machine learning is still very, very, very junior. Uh, there hasn't yet been a case which is very appealing there yet, uh, meaning showing results uh, above the classical techniques. Um, there is uh, investigations in uh, <clears throat> Robust quantum machine learning, exactly the kind of transformations I'm showing you that the, the, the classifies the robust. But uh, I think if quantum computing is successful, then uh, potentially, you know, quantum hardware, uh, potentially there could be some uh, accuracy gains down the line. But uh, right now it hasn't happened. Okay. Accu accuracy is just to say here, you know, accuracy is not the fundamental problem, I think, uh, in many cases. The problem is the accuracy and uh, proving things about the model. Thank you. Any other questions? I can uh, yeah, send you some links if you want <laughs> to the person here. Uh, would you please send us your presentation in PDF? Do you mind if we upload it on the conference website? Yeah, no problem. I'm happy to do that. OK, you'll do it after the conference. Thank you. Sure. Okay, we'd like to thank you once again for your interesting talk. And we'd like to award a crystal prize to each plenary speaker. We cannot hand it to you now, but I will just show, show it to you. <laughs> thank you. Just a second. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So we proceed to our next speaker. Which is Professor Romiana Pecheva Forsyth. She is a professor of educational technology at the Faculty of Pedagogy, Sofia University, where she has been employed since 1995. She is a director of the Center for Distance Learning at the Sofia University and the National Center for Distance Education. She holds a postdoctoral degree from the Institute of Education, University of London, in the field of digital pedagogy. For the last 12 years, she has been the leader of international and national projects with importance for the modernization of higher education in the field of digitization. Professor Pecheva, sorry, I'll give you the floor now. Thank you.
for the yes, presentation. You are a presenter now. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you very much to the organizers of this conference for inviting me and making me a part of it to be among you and sharing my thoughts, my findings, my concerns, and the results of our research is an honor and a pleasure. And of course, um, I expect that this will turn into a discussion, if not today, um, in the near future. Um, I'm going to talk about the effect of the teacher experience, teacher's experience in online education during the pandemic on their views of strengths and weaknesses of e-learning based on the research we as a distance education center conducted at Sofia University after the start of the pandemic and after the forced transition overnight from face to face to distance education. Uh, we all witnessed the expansion of e-learning and distance education from the beginning of the century but the people like me that dealt with uh, this phenomena, that applied it in education, that participated in accreditation of distance education, in teaching staff how to do it in theory and in practice, never expected, never dreamt of, never imagined that one day uh, distance education and online learning will become overnight a part of our lives and that the whole world will start teaching and learning online. So what is the effect of this uh, transition overnight from face-to-face -to, -face to distance education? I think we all as professionals and experts ask ourselves these questions. As uh, of course we experience the consequences of this transition in everyday practice in facing a lot of difficulties of the staff and learners um, in uh, everyday teaching and learning. So in my presentation, I'm going to go through saying a few words about expansion of online education during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, what uh, are the findings of the research, which was very extensive during the pandemic on the effect of online learning on its quality and different aspects of teaching and learning with a special focus on the strengths and weaknesses of e-learning which were proved over the years how do they change uh, in the from the perspective of teachers uh, during their experience in online learning and i will share some uh, results and analysis of our research that we conducted at sophie university so as I said, we were all, all expected that uh, e-learning and distance education, so-called digitalization of higher education or digital transition of higher education will take some time, uh, um, especially having in mind the quality of e-learning and having in mind that we all insisted that the teachers are prepared to perform to conduct such type of education, e-learning, that guarantees its quality. But 2020 surprised us. It was a year of change. And there have never been so many students and staff, almost the whole world, which were exposed to online learning and teaching. And the practice and the research show that this turned out to be a very big provocation to higher education systems. But we were uh, inclined to look at it from the positive and from the negative, from optimistic and pessimistic point of view, trying to find some benefits, but also being careful about uh, negative consequences of this transition. Um, so on one hand, yes, this was stress and provocation on institutions, but on the other hand, it created, it created a historic opportunity for universities, for staff, uh, and it triggered a general transformation uh, of learning and teaching in higher education towards a digital transformation of higher education. Mm, a lot of uh, reports were published during the pandemic. Uh, one of the reports of UNESCO on the 1st of April 2020 
um, show that uh, all schools and higher education institutions were closed with the beginning of the pandemic and over one billion and a half learners were affected, which in fact constitutes close to 90% of the learners enrolled in the world. Big change happened to Europe, although European universities were the ones in comparison to, let's say, uh, Africa and Latin America uh, that were prepared for this digital transition. So in a very short time, all universities, according to the report of European University Association, 95% of the universities in Europe switched to distance learning um, in the whole institution and um, only uh, like 4% uh, provided um, uh, this uh, online learning only in some faculties. So only for one term, one half academic year, um, COVID-19 pandemic affected all aspects, components of uh, education. They affected teaching, learning, assessment, student services and support, staff and students' mobility, digital infrastructure, infrastructure administration, uh, administration etc um, but of course it with no doubt changed and we hope in positive direction the knowledge and skills competencies of educators how to design and implement e-learning as well as this affected their attitudes their assessment towards the strengths and weaknesses of e-learning in comparison to face-to-face campus-based education but it's interesting question in which direction was this change? How positive and how negative was it? So on this slide, I'm presenting some findings of research during the pandemic with the focus on uh, this transition, which was uh, published uh, by Hodges and Quarters called The Difference Between Emergency Remote Teaching and Online Learning. So the authors came to the conclusion observing um, a big range of uh, such courses, that the courses which were quickly adapted from face-to-face -face online mode of teaching in response to the crisis, differ significantly from the courses that are specially designed for online distance learning, the ones that we know that we accredit, that we apply for accreditation. So what is different? They call them emergency remote teaching, which aims to provide a temporary fully remote teaching solution but not to recreate a robust educational ecosystem. So these courses were uh, built as almost an analog of face-to-face -face learning in order to save the situation. Despite of the variety of practices in the use of technologies during the pandemic, and these practices varied a lot from very high quality to very low quality, but despite of this quality, the teachers around the world enriched enormously uh, their experience in online education, which certainly uh, affected their perspectives towards its advantages and disadvantages. The topic, uh, the theme of strengths and weaknesses of e-learning in comparison to face-to-face -to -face education were a matter of discussion, of dispute even over the years. And of course, during the last two, cent uh, two decades, um, with the development of the technology, um, the better, the higher level is the technology uh, and developed, the less are the weaknesses that we witness of its uh, integration in education. So uh, although in the beginning of the century, uh, weaknesses related to technology were dominating, like limitation of certain technologies, like limitation of access to technology, poor infrastructure, etc. We, um, with uh, uh, gaining experience in your learning application, the strengths has, have become more and more and more and more convincing for people practicing e learning for these years. So on this slide, you can see the proof in literature and practice uh, strengths, advantages of e learning in comparison to face to face education, like its flexibility means that we can learn, the students can learn at any, any time from anywhere using any type of device. Accessibility 
uh, in relation to the access to global resources, but also broadening the access to education in general, including for um, some some groups of uh, isolated uh, groups of uh, people. Also, active learning as the design for e learning by default is design is learner centered design. It is um, designed for learning. Interactivity, which um, allow, as e-learning allows interactions among students, between students and teachers and experts, but also between students and e-resources. Collaboration, collaborative learning, because e-learning through networking allows uh, easy and um, meaningful communication between students, eliminating any physical barriers. And also with the development of big range of IT tools, um, we allow for different pedagogical approaches and methods to be applied in teaching and learning. So for all experts, it is clear that these advantages exist in, uh, 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 as a potential advantages, but they can be realized on practice only when the appropriate pedagogies are combined, combinated, with relevant technologies. On the other hand, of course, as everything else, uh, it has uh, e-learning has proved some weaknesses and disadvantages in comparison to face-to-face uh, -face learning. Among them still are technological issues. Uh, everybody during teaching could experience some problems with infrastructure, access to internet, but also the success and quality of this education very much depends on the digital competencies, both of teachers and learners. Um, some authors point the communi communication issues relating to the different styles of uh, communication of students that they prefer. Also, some research identified uh, um, some possibility of uh, students' isolation, uh, especially when they are engaged in many, many courses or in very uh, many uh, social uh, types of interactions. Um, also, one weakness that is identified relates to learners' engagement because they are very often distracted when they work from home or from, st from the street. And e-learning especially requires special, uh, self, um, better self-organization, self-discipline, and time management. Among one of the weaknesses that is pointed out recently is the teacher's over, uh, workload in relation to um, the necessity of a lot of um, a much input of efforts in course design and course implementation. So all these uh, are uh, well known among practitioners and among researchers. So we put this as a theoretical bi basis in our uh, empirical research. The empirical research at Sofia University came as a result, as a response to students' negative attitudes towards online education in the beginning of the pandemic uh, transition to online education. Students, some of the students even ask their fees to be returned back to them as, um, they, as they said they were paying to attend classes, to talk and communicate with their um, stu uh, uh, co-students and teachers. So there was... Um, uh, a movement of students at Sofia University to, uh, against distance education and we decided as a center of distance education to uh, conduct this research and to see uh, what are the factors affecting the quality of e-learning, the quality of assessment, uh, student satisfaction, but also some of this research was um, aiming to identify what is the impact of experience of Sofia University academic staff um, during the forced introduction of online education on their views and perspectives about e-learning and its strengths and limitations. As many of our colleagues start, started complaining of being involved um, in online education as they were not prepared, as this took all, all of their time, as it was a great stress to them. So we decided to prove by using research methods, what are the reasons for this? We tried to answer the following questions. What was the experience in integrating technology in education that teachers had 
before the pandemic, how this experience changed during the pandemic when they were forced to do that without having any choice, and how factors as digital skills and experience in e-learning can affect the views of teachers on strengths and weaknesses of e-learning and their assessment of e-learning in general, as we find is very important for future digitalization of higher education. So I'm not going to go in details about research, um, methodology of this research, it's written in the paper, but in general it's quantitative research, it covers areas like uh, use of technology before pandemic, use of technology after, during the pandemic, e-assessment during the COVID, and of course demographics, and these data that I'm going uh, to share with you and the analysis focuses mainly on the first two sections of this research. Let me tell you a few words, although all Bulgarians probably are aware of it, about the context of this research. You know that Sofia University is uh, the biggest and uh, oldest in Bulgaria, but it's also the most traditional, so to say, campus-based university. And at the moment, we have only two master degree programs which are accredited for distance education. We ran such a similar research, in fact, two, three years ago, before even uh, having an idea that the pandemic is going to come and change our lives, uh, professional. And um, during uh, and in this research, we identified like half of the research uh, academic staff claiming that they had experience in blended mode in using technology in education due to many projects in, the, in which they were involved. And nearly 20% of the teachers claimed they, had, they were experts in uh, online education. They used online education even before pandemic. So based on this data, we built our research and compared um, the results from the two uh, studies. In this research, I'm going to discuss with you, almost 400 participants from the university, academic staff took place, but only this number, three, four, five, seven, um, completed the whole questionnaire, and that's why we will share only data about them. 60% uh, female, all groups of um, teachers were represented, uh, with the least of them being very young, between 20 and 30 and over 60, but equal distribution of, of other groups. Uh, from all 16 faculties of the university, and also uh, good representation from all academic positions. Uh, only the professors were less than 20 and um, uh, assistant professors. So associate professors, uh, head assistant professors equally represent. So we had pre representation of all groups of um, academic staff. So um, uh, the teacher experience in integration of technology in face-to-face -face and online learning was explored through four main areas of teachers' expertise, teachers' uh, digital competencies, and here they are um, shown on this slide. So uh, first is how and whether they used e-resources in their teaching and in supporting students in self-preparation uh, during face-to-face -face and online mode of teaching. The, the, the other area of expertise is using technology for synchronous and asynchronous communication with students in the context and face of face-to-face -face and online learning. The third area is conducting e-learning activities in electronic environment, VLE, as supplement to the face-to-face teaching, and the last one is using e-assessment uh, in both contexts, face-to-face -face and uh, online. So analysis of the data in responses of uh, the whole respondents gave us a reason to split them into two main groups. The group of experienced teachers in e-learning, which consists of almost 30% of the whole um, uh, group of uh, respondents, uh, which is 102 teachers, and also, which is group A, and group B, these are teachers that we call non-experienced in e-learning teachers, who never or very rarely conducted online activities before and then after the pandemic. Although the first group, A group, the group of the experienced teachers, they run uh, online learning activities uh, before the pandemic means in parallel, a uh, face-to-face, even without being 
part of distance programs. So we explored what we did with the data. We compared the data between these two groups, looking at whether their experiences in e-learning differ, uh, differ from different points of view, different aspects, and which are the factors that affect these, uh, uh, these differences. So the first thing we discovered that the age and academic position of the respondents do not affect their belonging to one of the two groups, means that both in experienced and non-experienced groups, we had a, a representatives from all age groups and from all academic positions. But at the same time, the factor digital competence affected belonging to the specific group. Uh, the group of ex uh, teachers with experience in e-learning um, assumed themselves as experts in using a range of technologies and uh, um, assess their level as a high level of expertise in in digital uh, in using technology uh, while the, the other group uh, most of them big proportion of them uh, when they use technology then they need support and guidance so there is we discovered that there is a statistically significant difference between these two groups in relation to digital competence, which is logic, but this, uh, in this uh, case, um, the numbers, the data, the data analysis proves it. We also discovered significant, uh, uh, statistically significant dependence um, between the belonging to the group of experienced and non-experienced teachers and um, the frequency of integrated technology in their courses before the pandemic. So it is illustrated here on the, this graphic, and it is easy to identify that the teachers from Group A have more 20, well, it's, uh, yeah, 20, twice more teachers from Group A uh, integrated technology in all their courses before the pandemic and it is uh, uh, statistically significant in comparison to teachers that um, uh, use technologies on all their courses from non-experienced group. And also here, uh, it is uh, obvious that the teachers without experience, 20% of them never use technology in any of their courses before the pandemic. So how often the teachers use specific learning e-learning technologies or technology specific for e-learning uh, and activities in their face-to-face -face classes before the pandemic? On this um, table, you can see the comparative analysis of, in the, of the data between group A and group B um, uh, in relation to their responses always and very often use certain technology and rarely and never. So it is very clear from the first glance that the teachers who conducted online activities in VLE are 100% in group A and 0% in group B. What also makes an uh, impression is that the non-experienced teachers, um, they mainly use technologies for, uh, uh, as e-resources to support students' self-preparation or they also used, uh, provided students for used resources to support their own teaching. And here they used e e uh, emails for uh, asynchronous communication in, uh, with students and also required students to submit their work in electronic format. We discovered some statistically significant differences between the two groups in technologies that are more typical for e-learning, such as, and you can see the differences in these two groups in percentages, using interactive online applications, using synchronous communication tools for extracurricular communication with students. Uh, also here, using social networks for communication with students and using e-assessment and e-test. Here, the re representatives of uh, experienced group uh, are much more in terms of percentage than the representatives of group B. So it becomes clear that the, the experience, the 
colleagues in Group A, heading e-learning is uh, much higher, much better, much richer in, in e-learning in comparison to the group um, of non-experienced teachers, teachers from Group B, which are twice more in terms of numbers. Um, so this was before the pandemic. How the picture changed during the pandemic when everybody had no choice but to teach online? And the first question we tried to identify whether they differ or are similar was what type of learning VLE they use during the pandemic for their courses. So because Moodle is the, um, uh, the VLE of Sofia University, official VLE, it is clear that most groups use, use Moodle um, with, with no comments uh, on how did they use it. Uh, but twice more teachers from Group A use it platforms different from Moodle, like Google Classroom and uh, MS Teams. Um, and here, the number of non-experienced teachers raised, especially when it is about using email as key main uh, tool for teaching in their courses. In practice, we also identify that many of non-experienced colleagues uh, mainly use uh, non-asynchronous uh, uh, communication with their students by supplying, uh, sending them uh, tasks uh, uh, and getting back their, back, um, their um, uh, works, uh, their written works or artifacts. artifacts. So our um, conclusion here is that the teachers, non-experienced senior learning teachers, stick to the technologies they used before the pandemic in order to feel more secure in their teaching in uh, uh, during in the period of pandemic now on, on this slide you can see a comparison in the data for both groups experience group a and non-experience group b they use the same of the same technology before and during the pandemic so what uh, the, the, what uh, makes an impression from the comparison of this data on the graphic a is that there is no a big variation in, in data in percentage before and during the pandemic means that except for moving from social networks for communication with students to interactive online application and synchronous online communication um, uh, there were not significant differences in pedagogical approaches and using technologies for teachers of, from group A. And of course, before we were supposed to teach in virtual classroom, uh, social networking were replaced by teaching uh, in a virtual classroom. But it is obvious that not much stress was put on the teachers from group A uh, as they almost um, performed similar uh, activities uh, in supported by technology during the pandemic in comparison to the pre-pandemic time period. But what happens with the teachers from non-experienced group? Here we can witness some jumps in percentage, like uh, 15 percentage more teachers starting using key resources at all for teaching. They didn't have much chance. Also, they provided 25% more of the representatives provided more resources for cell preparation of students. They started using interactive online application, three times more teachers, and also using synchronous online communication. So it is obvious also from this data that a lot of change happened to the teachers with no experience in e-learning during the pandemic. Obviously, this put a huge stress on them by, first of all, changing to the extent they were all, uh, able to do that, their pedagogical approaches, but also by using new technologies, uh, technologies which they were supposed to um, use um, uh, on everyday, uh, to use on everyday basis. We found similar um, uh, results uh, by compar uh, comparing data on e-assessment. If you remember on one of the previous slides, uh, I provided this number in relation to the uh, use of e-tests e and e-assessment in general. Uh, these were 20, 
62 percentage from uh, group a used the test before the pandemic and only 10 percent use uh, e-assessment before the pandemic from group b uh, while that during the pandemic this percent increased a little bit in group a but jumped from 10 to 35 in the group b so in the field of assessment also there was some stress generated um, and one more thing about assessment uh, 50 percent half of the representatives of group b have never required students to present their works in the virtual classroom which means that um, they use the cl virtual classroom only for one to one one way communication for lecturing but never use it for interactive activities like sharing like um uh, uh, ex uh, using it for examinations, for proving authorship and uh, authentication of students, half of these students. So based on this data, on the experience of uh, both groups of teachers before and during the pandemic, we have formulated our hypothesis, which uh, sounds like this. The more diverse experience in online learning teachers have, the less stress and tension they would have in changing the modality of teaching from face to face to online, um, and the more positive attitudes and realistic evaluation on benefits and limitation of online learning they demonstrate. And, contra, um, and uh, conversely, the lack of experience in some teachers would lead to tension and stress when they change the modality and respectively this will shape their negative and often even biased evaluation assessment of the advantages and disadvantages of e-learning. So we gave them a list of advantages and disadvantages the way they are described in the literature and asked them to share their opinions, whether they, they um, um, uh, share this uh, um, these uh, advantages or disadvantages, what, what is their opinion and to what extent they appreciate them or not. And here you can see the, the differences in many of the cases, these differences are significantly, um, st statistically significant between the opinions of the group A and group B. Some conclusions, because I'm aware of the time. First of all, the most indisputable advantages uh, relate mainly to accessibility and logistics uh, of e-learning, like access to resources from any place and any time. This is the highest appreciated advantage. Str uh, also, the students are given an opportunity to learn on their own pace. This is more educational uh, and it's shared by the, both groups, although many more representatives from group A appreciated in comparison to representatives of group B. And also that the e-learning saves travel expenses, which is uh, definitely a logistic aspect of e-learning, which uh, you can see here 65%. Another conclusion that comes out from the data comparison is that twice, many, uh, twice as many representatives of uh, group A pointed the following advantages as indisputable. They are, most of them are um, educational. First of all, the opportunities for increasing the interactivity of learning when it is online. So interactivity, interaction, um, here interactivity, twice more than a group A than group B. The improvement of quality of education in general, 23% towards 7%. Opportunities to improve interactions between uh, the students and the students and the teacher, also twice more from group A than from group B. Uh, these all differences are statistically dependent, so belonging to one of the groups, the lack of experience and the uh, uh, availability of experience, uh, obviously affect this type of assessment. This is, there is also something that is very interesting for us, and it is that the answer to the question whether e-learning has advantages at all. So 30, close to 30% of Group B, unexperienced teachers, 
don't find any advantages in e-learning. And a very small percent, five from Group A, uh, claim the same. Um, in relation to disadvantages of e-learning, some conclusions come to mind immediately after looking at the data, and it's that the opinions of the teachers in the two groups um, were less contrasting. You can see that they can come close to each other and some of them even coincide. Exception is only the claim that online learning has a lower quality where um, the number of teachers from the first group the quality of instruction is lower, are twice less than the... You can see more than half of the teachers from the group, from group B, find the quality of your learning as lower than in comparison to face-to-face -face learning. The only drawback supported by the large number of respondents from both groups was the lack of social contact between teachers and students. Most of our colleagues and also the students from the other survey claim that e-learning does not allow for interaction, social interaction between students and learners. And of course, this can draw another conclusion about the type of design of these courses. They lack or they depress communication between teachers and, uh, and uh, students and the students themselves. The opinions of the two groups coincide regarding um, excessive workload, uh, as we mentioned from the beginning, in the beginning of presentation, this uh, weakness or drawback is shared um, among the professionals that uh, the design and implementation and especially assessment giving, providing feedback of students require a lot more work than in face-to-face -face education. And here again, we witness um, a very big difference in relation to um, whether um, uh, they see any disadvantages in e-learning. We, we have here one very positive, optimistic group of, uh, of representatives of first group, group A, which don't see any disadvantages in online learning. But uh, of course, yeah, and again, the group uh, representatives of group B, they don't see disadvantages in is only 2%, quite much more pessimistic. So the last graphic that I'm going to show is a very good illustration of distribution of optimists and pessimists on the front of e-learning design and implementation among the uh, studied uh, academic staff. Almost symmetrical are the answers on the question, if you have the opportunity to transform most of your courses into online courses, would you do that? So close to 70% of the of group A, experience group, would do that, would transform their teaching into online. And similar percent from group B, non-experience, would never do that. So a big question here is how we are going to perform um, digital transformation of higher education. After one year of online teaching of academic staff who wouldn't teach online anymore if this depends on their own choice. And I'm coming now to the conclusions and hopefully they will raise some questions and discussion. I have written them on the slides because I find them uh, important and I don't want to improvise on them. So the data analysis identifies an existence of interrelations between the digital competencies of teachers, of the staff, and their experience in online learning before the pandemic, and the different aspects of their online teaching during the pandemic, such as their choice of e-learning environment, the ratio of synchronous and asynchronous forms of online teaching they performed, the frequency and variety of using e-resources in teaching and also in supporting students in their self-preparation. The tools and for, uh, forms of e-assessment they use during the pandemic. Another important uh, conclusion for me um, is uh, um, in relation to the belonging of one of these two groups, uh, experienced and non-experienced before the pandemic. 
So the, trans the, uh, the transition from face to face, from face to face to distance online education for teachers with digital competencies and with experience, whether sufficient or not, but experience in online learning has been made much smoother from face to face to online learning and less stressful for this group. Uh, this uh, hasn't caused significant changes in their pedagogical approaches and in the use of technology during the pandemic. So from there, it did not affect their optimistic, positive view on uh, and perspective on online learning. And just the opposite, in the group of teachers with low digital competencies and without such experience, the transition to online learning has caused serious pressure for change in the teaching, pedagogical approaches, and therefore has caused greater professional stress. So in their practice, the non-experienced teachers apply approaches and technologies, technologies that they are used to during before the pandemic in face-to-face -face education. So the courses they created online were very close, were analog to the models they used in their face-to-face -face teaching. They use technology mainly to provide resources via email to the students for self-preparation. They use asynchronous communication. They require students to send their work for assessment by email. Most often, and because they were pushed to do so, they use virtual classroom, but only to give lectures as an analog to face-to-face -to -face, uh, lectures, but not involving students in interaction in the virtual classroom. So this significantly narrowed the palette of, of uh, specific elements of online learning. And therefore, we find that our, our findings from our research very much uh, confirm, coincide with uh, what Hodge uh, called uh, distance learning model, um, uh, emergency remote teaching, remote teaching, which is only to provide temporary fully remote teaching solution, but not to create a new type, a robust educational ecosystem typical for e-learning. So the extremely simplified models of online learning, which were close analog to face-to-face -to -face learning, which were applied during the pandemic, but by non-experienced teacher, but also with the, by teachers with very poor uh, experience in online learning, has formed negative attitudes and assessments toward towards e-learning in general and towards uh, its um, uh, advantages um, and uh, strong um, uh, characteristics. And these teachers did not recognize the strengths of e-learning, which were proven by the theory and practice, and they also exaggerated its, its negative aspects. Moreover, they turned into enemies of e-learning by declaring that they would never um, uh, teach online if this depended on them. And finally, the pandemic created preconditions both for the wider dissemination of e-learning and enrichment of the experience of teachers in uh, this form of education, but also for discrediting its quality in so far as teachers without experience uh, and um, training had to teach online. And the only approach for rehabilitation of e-learning now, after the pandemic, is obviously related to the preparation of the university staff, and on, not only them, also teachers from all uh, types of education, for design and uh, implementation of quality learning, through which they could take advantage of the potential benefits um, provided by technology, but also neutralize and minimize its limitation in a pedagogically relevant manner. So we again, um, we can again talk about e-learning and digitalization of higher education as a great benefit that we can take a lot of advantages in the near future. So I'm coming back to you. I hope I didn't speculate too much with the time. No, it's fine. Thank you, Romiana, for the presentation. It's very relevant for all of us, actually, nowadays. 
So the conclusion is we have to train our teachers in using e-learning technologies, right? Yes. Otherwise, nobody wants to deal with the e-learning in the future. Okay. Any questions from the audience? Okay, there are some questions in the public chat. Yes, uh, Ilian Petrov, do your data analysis takes account of the specifics of the educational programs? For example, philology or medicine. This is a key material aspect, while the experience of teachers and its self-assessments is mainly subjective. Uh, well, what I said uh, was that um, we had representatives from all faculties. Uh, we did not share any data uh, and comparative analysis of the data depending on the scientific field. Uh, and it's not, yeah, not shared in this presentation. But yes, we are aware that the subject matter that is taught really makes difference uh, in terms not only of experience and of design and implementation of your learning, but also uh, to the attitude of teachers uh, towards e learning in general. Uh, we have this uh, experience in the past. We decided we uh, uh, had some courses, classes with the representatives of uh, faculties of maths and mathematics and informatics, also, also physics and chemistry. And in my impression is that uh, these colleagues are uh, generally neg um, negative towards e learning. Uh, but after training, they discover some specific ways and strategies to teach online and take the advantages of uh, online learning. Uh, what we can uh, uh, say here is that for subjects like uh, science, physics, chemistry, mathematics, the best models of e-learning are blended learning and hybrid learning, uh, taking into consideration the type of subjects and the subject matter really matters when it is about e-learning design. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, no. Thank you very much for... And thank you. Thank you for inviting me. ...for the presentation. You also awarded the crystal prize we oh, will thank, you very much. thank you very much thank you we'll so actually much. we'll actually send it to you with the colleagues from sofia university who are in russia now great, great. okay okay thank Thanks. you see you and we proceed to our last speaker for tonight, for today, Yorgos Crisanto. Yorgos is the research director of the Center of Interactive Media, Smart Systems and Emerging Technologies. He is also a professor at the Computer Science Department of the University of Cyprus. Yorgos was educated in the UK, Queen Mary College, University of London, and worked for several years as a research fellow and a lecturer at University College London. He has published over 85 papers in journals and international conferences on computer graphics and virtual reality, and is a co-author of the book Computer Graphics and Virtual Environments from Realism to Real Time. Jorgos serves as an associate editor for the journal Computer Graphics Forum and a review editor for Frontiers in Robotics in AI. He serves as the local or overall coordinator of over 25 research projects related to research interests that lie in general area of 3D computer graphics. So... Yorgos. 
I major presenter, you have the floor. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, I'm going to switch this off. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this exciting conference. And uh, it's actually a pity that uh, this is happening online because I'd love to visit uh, uh, Ruse. We've had uh, an agreement between the University of Cyprus and Russia for quite a few years now, and I was hoping that this year I would manage to get to, to see you, but maybe next year. So, as... Uh, um, there's something wrong with my graphics. Um, as uh, hardware and software get more powerful, we see 3D graphics being used in, uh, in many different applications, ranging from uh, med medical, uh, the training, simulation, and so on. But what's most uh, familiar to all of us is maybe computer games and movies. Now, in such applications, maybe the hardest thing to do is actually simulate virtual humans. And that's understandable because as humans ourselves, we are accustomed to looking in, in a lot of detail, both at the appearance and the, and the, and the, the behavior of uh, our counterparts. So that's why my group has been working on uh, virtual humans, virtual char characters for over 20 years now. Um, we started since 2001 when we were together with uh, Svetomir at uh, University College London. And uh, we started at looking at uh, the issue of rendering virtual humans, because every, every single human needs uh, tens of thousands of polygons to render in, in uh, a realistic way. So we took a data-driven approach. We took lots of pictures in, uh, around the virtual human pre-processing, and then we created what you see on the side, an imposter, which was uh, segmented and we kept the normals. And then at runtime, we could illuminate it, draw, draw shadows, animate it. And it, it enabled us to render 20,000 humans on a, on a laptop at the time. Later on, we moved on to look at, again, data-driven techniques for behavior of humans. For example, we looked at techniques that uh, where we captured real people walking and then we created databases of small uh, snippets of behavior. And then at runtime, we query this, uh, behavior, this uh, database and uh, find the, the, the right behavior for the right time, which uh, enabled us to create uh, videos such as the one we see above without needing any rules for collision avoidance or, or working in pairs or, or doing whatever, all based on, on data-driven techniques. But actually, what I will talk about today is, is our more recent techniques, more, more recent work on animation, the animating the human body. I mean, if you're animating a rigid body like the pirate uh, ship here, or a semi-rigid uh, like the um, Luxor Junior we see on the other side, uh, you can apply physics, you can use equations, and you can uh, compute uh, uh, deterministically the, the behavior. But this cannot be applied really on a human body. I mean, when you have a human, it, 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 uh, there's a lot of factors on, on how someone moves and, uh, and behaves. I mean, it might be the mood, the age, the, the emotion, uh, and, and, and the tiredness, and all sorts of different factors. That's why in um, Whenever we need uh, uh, realism, for example, like in movies such, such as we see here, we bring in actors, we motion capture them, we capture their movements like we see on the left, and then we apply it to, to the virtual characters like we see on the right. And here you see an example of, uh, uh, of how this works in our lab. Here we have a dancer that wears the, this motion capture suit with markers, these lights, and there's many cameras around that capture these uh, markers. They, it's, using triangulation, they find the positions and then they construct the skeleton, which we can then um, dress and render in any way we like. For example, here we, we show the capture dance in, uh, in the museum of uh, Haji Gorgadis Cornesios in the central university. So, for the rest of my talk, I will concentrate on uh, techniques for uh, processing and editing motion capture data. Of course, this is nothing, is not uh, 
new to, to use motion capture data. There's uh, hundreds of papers about it. But what's particular about our work is that we're focusing on, on style and emotion, on the finer detail of, uh, of the capture data. So I, I will start first by describing the kind of data we use. And in fact, we decided to use uh, dancing as our uh, test, um, test data because especially some forms of dancing are, uh, uh, carry a lot of challenges. For example, if you think of, of modern dance, it's unstructured and it, 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 can, uh, it, it has a wide range of movement. So if we can make our, our algorithms work on those, it can work on it. Then I'll describe a bit our tool that we use, the Laban Movement Analysis, and describe a few of the algorithms, so show some results and some applications. OK, so uh, over the last few years, we've been uh, um, capturing a lot of uh, dances. Actually, today I saw, uh, I saw your excellent dance that uh, you started this session with. And I was thinking that we don't have any, any uh, Bulgarian dances in our database. So maybe at some point, we should uh, invite some of your uh, colleagues to come to Cyprus so we can capture them. In any case, we created this uh, database that uh, is uh, possibly the biggest database of motion capture uh, dances in the world. We have over like 300 uh, complete dances. Some of them are still being uh, uh, imported. Uh, and we, we, in this database, we have different data, like the, the, the video, the, the raw motion capture, the skeletons, the, the actors, uh, the, the characters. OK, in order to, to process and argue about this uh, motion capture data, we decided to look at what uh, the experts do beyond the computer science. So we look at the, what choreographers do, and they use, uh, most of them, they use the Laban movement analysis, which is a, a system that was initiated in the 30s by Rudolf Laban, and it's used for interpreting, visualizing, and notating dance and other movements. And instead of doing, and, and this, it doesn't do what we traditionally do in computer graphics, which is compare uh, positions and rotations and geometry. But rather, it splits the, uh, the movement into four components, uh, which are more easily intuitive, understandable by a human, but not necessarily by a computer. So for example, it has the body component that captures the connectivity between the different parts of the body, the, the, the hands, the legs. The effort component that uh, talks about the, the intention and the dynamic quality uh, of the movement and its energy. The shape component that analyzes the way the body changes shape. And the space component that describes the movement in relation with the environment. So uh, what we did is that we tried to capture these uh, four components using some computational uh, measurements. So we came up with 31 different features, which would compute over a short period of uh, frame window, like um, 25, 30 frames. And we compute measurements such as minimum, maximum, mean, standard deviation. And that results in 120 different feature movements. For example, for the body component, we compute the displacement and orientation, the torso and hip height. For the effort, we compute the head orientation because it needs to, it encodes the intent. We, we compute the velocity, acceleration, jerk, and so on. And what this allows us to do is that it now allows us to, to be able to compare movements. And let's take this example. If we have a teacher like the blue uh, animated character on the left that is showing a, a, a dance movement, and then we have a student who's trying to imitate, we want to be able to compare those two movements, but not necessarily um, point to point, but rather we want to, to be able to say something more useful to the student. So the way we do it is that we compare the four, we compute the four uh, LMA components for each movement, and then we calculate the pairwise Pearson correlation for, for the four, and that gives us an, both an overall uh, evaluation, but it, it also gives us, if we have a look here, it also tells us where we go wrong. For example, there's not enough effort, or uh, the shape is not right, or the space. So it gives us more information which is useful for the, uh, this kind of evaluation. The other thing we can do, we can do query 
uh, by example. We can do like, for example, think about it as a Google search, but instead of using words or images, we're using uh, a short movement. So here on the left, you see a sample, and we can go through all our database and find similar uh, um, examples to that, uh, to that movement. For example, here uh, we see, let me show you, it, this was a movement that showed to be similar, and even in cases where, um, as we will see here, it's, uh, it's the different hand and it doesn't lean as much, but it still has the same kind of movement, so it, it comes up as quite similar. Okay, so this allows us to, to be able to compare movements, but actually we want to do more than that. So what we try to do is being able to classify the style and emotion of, uh, of a certain movement. So, for example, here we can see two very different dances. The first one on the left, uh, the Maori haka dance, is a very angry, uh, aggressive, let's say, dance, while the one on the right is a more slow, sad, sad uh, dance. So, we, we, in our uh, work, we are using the Russell Circumplex uh, model of effect, where this is a way of mapping the different emotions onto a 2D disk. The x-axis, sorry, the x-axis of the disk uh, is the balance, it talks about the pleasantness, and the um, y-axis, the vertical axis, is the intensity of the movement. So here we see individual um, emotions, but actually it's a continuous uh, space. Uh, there's emotions in between as well, which is um, in between values. Um, okay, so in order to be able to do that, we needed to capture some more data. So we invited six professional dancers with different backgrounds, some uh, from uh, with ballet background uh, or theater or modern dance and so on. And we asked each one of them to uh, dance 12 different emotions, modern dance, but expressing 12 different emotional states three uh, from each of the four quadrants of uh, the circumference model. And here we see one of those performers that uh, does all 12 uh, uh, modern dances. So this was our data. Then uh, we trained a classifier. We tried many different classifiers, and, uh, like SVMs and uh, uh, the different types, but uh, we found the random forest to be the, the best one. So we, we captured uh, small clips from uh, our training data. We extracted the LMA features, and then we, we took them through the classifier. We, we know also the ground truth because we, we, we have the, da the data, and we trained the classifier. Then given a new movement, we can extract the LMA features, take it through a classifier, and it, it tells us what kind of uh, dance, what kind of emotion it carries. And this actually was very successful, and here we see an example result, where here we have one of the dancers who does something new that was not in our training data, and you can see that most of the time, and that's why it's green, green or light green, it means that it finds the exact emotion or something very, very close to, to uh, the, the exact emotion, and in only very few cases, does it uh, misclassify the red, the red cases? Okay, so we can, uh, we can compare emotions, we can classify emotions, but it would be interesting to do more than that. For example, let's say we bring someone in, uh, we bring some uh, actors in, we do some motion capture, we finish, and then we process the data, and then we decide that, you know, we wanted this movement to be a little bit more angry or a little bit more uh, sad or something. So we want to be able, in, in a traditional uh, way, you would uh, call the actors again, recapture everything, reprocess them, which would take ages and it was gonna cost a lot of money. But what we wanted to do is being able to actually modify the, the, the movement that we have captured without changing much the geometric, uh, uh, animation, but uh, changing mostly the emotion. And we want to do that without on unstructured and unstructured motions, like modern dance, uh, without registration, so we don't have the exact uh, uh, dance in different styles or uh, 
uh, repeatedly and we are in 3D winter. So we go back to our LMA features, but now we have too many, so we want to reduce them. So what do we do? Consistent features, and then we map, and we we map each one of these clips using the method I, I mentioned onto uh, onto this circumflex model, and it gives us a certain emotion. And then we allow the user to be able to to decide how to change it, make it more excited, make it more tired, more. Uh, uh, sad, whatever. And then, once we have the user's request, what we can do, we can find uh, the values of the features at the specific requested uh, emotion, and then we run an optimization where we try to, to change the animation by moving the, the end effectors, the limbs of the, of the character, in such a way that it gets our features as close to the desired one, while at the same time it changes the animation as little as possible. So we run this optimization and it moves, it changes a little bit the animation and we apply that using an inverse kinematic and, and here is the result we get. So here on the top left we have the original motion, at the bottom we have something which is a little bit more sad and a little bit more slow. And you can see on the top right the differences. Actually, maybe here you can see better the differences. So we have the, the, the input motion is the middle one. And if you look at the top, we have a more angry uh, character. And if you look the green on the left, on the bottom, it's a more bored character. So bear in mind that actually our data didn't, have, didn't even have a walking sequencing. We just had dances. And we gave it a normal walk, and it managed to modify it without changing much the movement, but modify the style. OK, so then how about if we look at the whole movement, uh, as, as, at the whole sequence as a whole, not just small movements. So we want to be able to compare different sequences, so for example, different dances. In order to do some clustering, or you see, you want to see later, as do an ethnography. Let me give you some motivation. Here we see the same performer doing two different dances. Actually, it's the same dance, but he danced it twice. And because it's uh, in Greek dance is quite free, you can uh, vary the the sequence by which you, you do the movements. It's essentially more or less the same dance with the same movements and everything, but you cannot compare it one to one. It, it, it doesn't match, it doesn't, uh, you cannot uh, compare it. So the idea we had was to, to actually break the motion into short temporal movements, what we call motion words. Yeah? And then we find the distribution of these words in, in our sequence and use, uh, we borrowed an idea from computer vision, use it as a bag of motion words. And then we take the distribution of this uh, motion words and, and use it as a signature of the specific dance sequence. Uh, of course, every single little uh, motion work is, is slightly different. So one of the problems we're facing is we need to cluster them cluster the similar ones, so we can reduce the number of uh, uh, words into what we call motifs, uh, so that we can have a reasonable number of uh, beans in our distribution. Otherwise, it, would be, uh, it wouldn't be possible to do any reasonable comparison. So here we used uh, a, a neural network, a trivial loss uh, network, that manages to, to actually cluster this um, these movements uh, together. And here we see some examples. We see four different types of uh, dances, salsa, modern dance, Greek folk dancing, and Indian Bollywood. And for each one, we see three different sequences. And we see the, the, the percentages of times that this sequence appears within the sequence. Uh, so for example, if we look at Greek folk dancing, in that specific sequence, uh, dancing with the arms stretched uh, left and right, appear 25% of the time. And uh, hitting the leg, 6% of the time. Now, uh, once we have this uh, cluster of words into the motifs, we can create the distribution into, into the beams. And then we, we have the, the, motion, the motion signature of each dance. And you can see here that different dances 
uh, have different distributions of, of uh, beans. So now what we can do, we can go back to our example and you can see that although the two dances look, uh, they're not synchronized, they look different, they're different, the order is different and whatever, if we look at the sequences, actually they are quite the same. Uh, and you can use that not only for dancing, you can use it for whatever. Jorgos, Jorgos you, you yeah. stop sharing the screen for some reason. Oops. Okay, let me try again. I think my... Uh, I, I'm not... Um, I don't seem to be... Ah, okay, okay, a presenter. Okay, I made you a presenter again. Okay. Yeah, you see it now? Yes. Okay. Okay, okay. so uh, what I was saying is that this works actually for whatever kind of data you, you give it. So here we trained it with different kind of movements and it can, it can identify when a, a, a movement changes immediately. Now, actually our current work is actually looking to go a step further. We don't just want to be able to classify and compare, but we want to be able to create a character that actually dances, create the dance uh, on the fly. So here we give it some music, we can give it the faster music, slower music, and our character learns using a neural network uh, how to dance while still keeping within the same signature of, uh, of the dance. So if we tell him to, to the character to dance salsa, it will stay within the, the limits that the signature of the salsa. I'm not gonna explain the full detail here because this is still under review. I'm just showing some results. Okay, since uh, we don't have much time, I'll go to some applications, in particular two applications, the Dance Ethnography and the Dance Museum. So we decided to, to have a look if we can use our technique to compare the dances not only of uh, Cyprus and Greece, but uh, of around the region. So we captured quite a few more uh, dances, about 72 dances of, of uh, the region, actually not the immediate region, going also into Asia. Uh, and dances, uh, depending on how far they are on the tree. And of course we have mostly what we were expected, Greek and Cypriot are closer together and some of the Balkans are closer together. But actually we also found some surprises. For example, we found that uh, the Egyptian belly dance was very similar, closely related to J Chinese uh, Jingjiang dance. We thought it was a mistake of our algorithm, but actually then we asked uh, some uh, professionals and they told us that actually the two dancers have the same uh, original oriental uh, origin. So our algorithm clearly identified them uh, correctly. Okay, so our latest uh, um, kind of venture, I would say, is to create the first virtual dance museum. At the moment, we loaded mostly Greek and Cypriot uh, dances as a way to uh, promote our uh, local folk uh, tradition. But uh, we intend uh, in the near future to, to make that into an international, uh, the first international dance museum. And um, Okay, here we have some of the dances we captured, but actually not only because if you're going to do a, a proper work, you need information about the dresses, the musical instruments, the musicians, uh, the objects people use, and so on. So we have uh, quite a, a detailed uh, template which uh, we fill with all this information. Here you see the one of the pages showing the different dances. If we click on one of them, it comes up with the information, including the storytelling, what the, what the dance is trying to convey, who was dancing, who is the performer that was captured, and stuff like that. And here we see some of the um, uh, 
the little videos that are stored in, in, in each uh, dance showing uh, uh, how this dance works. We also have the video of the person being captured. And this can actually, uh, we also have it in 3D so people can uh, turn it around and, and uh, play around it. So to conclude, I mean, virtual humans are hard to represent and simulate the equations. So that's why uh, a lot of the work has been done using data-driven techniques. And now with uh, you know, modern, uh, modern deep learning techniques, actually we have a lot more tools and we can go a lot further than we could uh, beforehand. And there is still a lot of uh, way to go. For example, uh, we're not very good at doing uh, multi-character interactions and reactive characters. Or uh, when it comes to facial expressions and uh, capturing enough detail in the face in real time in order to be able to in, uh, interact with uh, characters that need some work as well. And um, finally, I will uh, close with a bit of advertising as, uh, as uh, uh, Sergio mentioned at the beginning of. Uh, in my, his introduction, I'm, I'm, I'm a professor at the University of Cyprus, but I'm also the uh, research director of a new center of excellence, which was set up by uh, UCL, Max Planck, and the three public universities of Cyprus. And uh, this center is focusing on interactive media. It was set up about th three years ago and already have 85 employees working on all sorts of different areas of interactive media. We have 16 small uh, teams of researchers looking at uh, visual sciences, human factors and design, communications and AI. And uh, we also have uh, a scheme for invited speakers. So if anyone wants to visit us, we're very happy to have people come over and uh, give presentations and we can host people. Thank you very much. That's it for me. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you, Jorgos, for the interesting presentation. And I hope to see you here with us next year. Hopefully. <laughs> we have an Erasmus agreement, so you're always welcome. So any questions? Any questions from the... I will ask a question. How, how many dances have you captured, actually? Not, not dances, how many characters approximately in your database now? Okay, we have, uh, I mean, we used like uh, four or five different dance schools in uh, Cyprus. Although we did have some people come from Greece as well. Uh, so we captured, I don't know, maybe like 15, 20 different people dancing, but uh, we must have almost close to three, more than 300 different complete dances. How uh, many? 300. 300. But many of them are modern dances, so it's not all traditional. The traditional are, are less. There are maybe like uh, 70, 70, 80 different traditional dances. Okay, and when you said that you can generate some emotion, maybe there should be some constraints there, because if someone says generate both sad and happy dance at the same time, what happens? Well, I mean, it's, it's not possible, because we have this uh, circumplex model, and you need to choose a point on that right. model. Okay. So, okay. And that maps to the emotions, you cannot say both sides. You cannot choose two points at the same time. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It would be it would be difficult to <laughs> to simulate both at the same time. But you also captured not only traditional Cypriot dancing, but also Latin American like uh, salsa and so on. Yeah, we captured quite a lot actually. We even captured, uh, yeah, in uh, Zumba and uh, even some. Uh, we have Serbian dances, we have uh, uh, Turkish dances, we have uh, even some Chinese and Indian dances. We have, we have different stuff. Yeah, I will come next time to you to capture some Bulgarian dance. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Any other questions?
No? Okay. Thank you very much, Jorgos. Thank you. Here is your crystal prize. I hope to hand it to you next year. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay, now our plenary session is finished. I would like to remind you about tomorrow sessions and they start at 9 Bulgarian time. At 11.30 to 12, we have a coffee break and then we continue with our sessions in the afternoon. At uh, half past two, at this link, the same link as the plenary session, we will uh, give the best paper awards. It, they are about two in each session. So the best paper award ceremony will be, as I said, at half past two. Okay. Any questions? Any questions? Daniela is typing something. So in the conference program, which is on the website, you can find the links to your sessions. They were given here also in the public chat, but you can find them in the conference program, which is on the conference website. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much for participating in the plenary session, and we hope to see you tomorrow in the conference sessions. Have a good evening and cheers. We are going to a restaurant now who are here face to face. <laughs>